Dear students, in this lecture, I continue the description of the muscular tissues. As you know, we have three types of muscular tissues. The common feature of these tissues is that all of them has this type of energy-efficient, forceful contraction mechanism, which is based on sliding on mo molecules in each other. Uh, the three muscle types, the skeletal muscle, the cardiac muscle, and the smooth muscle, differs in many aspects, in the structure, in size, power, contraction, control, and occurrence. The skeletal muscle was described in details in the previous lecture. Now I want to talk about the two other muscles. Both the cardiac and the smooth muscle consist of cells. Each cell has a single nucleus. The main difference between them is that the cardiac muscle have uh, a kind of uh, brickle-shaped uh, uh, cells which uh, connect to each other, forming a, a fiber-like structure, while the smooth muscle cells spindle-like units. Uh, the size is different. The cardiac muscle in cross-section is much bigger than the smooth muscle. The diameter of the smooth muscle is equal or even less than the erythrocyte. Uh, the cardiac muscle is much weaker than the skeletal muscle. There is a good reason for that. It is designed for reliability and not for force. So it must work under any condition, otherwise we are in a big problem. Uh, the contraction uh, of the cardiac muscle is similar to that of the uh, skeletal muscle by 30%, and this has a, uh, a considerable self-control. Without nerve, it works very, uh, very well. The numerohumeral uh, uh, effects can modify somehow, but without any kind of nerve or any kind of bioactive material can work fine. It occurs in the heart and uh, in some of the large veins. The smooth muscle is, uh, 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 has a middle uh, strength. It uh, very much can contract by, by 80%, down to 20% of the original size. Contraction is slow, but the specificities can contract lasting. It can contract for days without any tiredness. Uh, the, it controls both the nervous system and the uh, bioactive materials and located in the internal organs and the vessels. And let's see the cardiac muscle in more details. The cardiac muscle first looks like fibers. Uh, these form fiber-like structures, but as I mentioned, they are consisting of quadrangular uh, uh, shaped cells. Important thing is that the nuclei are always in the middle of this one. In a semi-thin section with a very good structure, you can very nicely see the cross striation, the same size as that of the skeletal muscle. And you can see these dark lines, these are the so-called Ebner lines, these are the real border lines between the cells. In a more realistic slide, similar to what we'll see on the practices, uh, some of these features are not as visible. The cross striation is very pale, it's a standard uh, thickness of slide, and uh, you can see, if you are lucky and uh, skillful, the Ebner lines, but many of the time you cannot. The only thing you can see, and this is why it easily distinguishes from the skeletal muscle, that the nuclei always in the middle of this fiber-like structures. Here you can compare them in cross-section. This is a skeletal muscle, just for comparison, and this is the cardiac muscle. Uh, as you can see, there are the most important difference is that the skeletal muscle always has the nucleus at the periphery. It's apparently, almost looks like outside of the uh, fiber, unlike the uh, cardiac muscle, in which the nuclei always in the middle. Here you can see the scale, an erythrocyte, and you can see the relative size of, uh, of them. And also in the larger magnified uh, picture, you can see the uh, nuclei in the middle, and also the, these dots are the myofibrils, similar to that of the skeletal muscle. Between the cardiac muscle cell, you can see dark nuclei. These are fibrocytes, and we do have connective tissue similar to the skeletal muscle between the cardiac muscle cells. Uh, as I mentioned, the Eber discs are the real border lines. In electron microscopy, you can see these are finger-like uh, alternating uh, structures by means of which the neighborhood cells will uh, get glued together, fixed to each other, and this is a, a, a real borderline. 
in, the, uh, in this model, which looks similar to what I showed you before in, on the skeletal muscle, uh, this is a kind of electromicroscopic reconstruction model. Uh, I will talk about the electromicroscopic structure of the cardiac muscle. Uh, first of all, uh, the proportion between the myofibrillus and the sarcoplasm is pushed in the ad advance of the sarcoplasm, which means that because of the less quantity of the myofibrillus, it's relatively weaker. However, because the abundant sarcoplasm, it has a lot of myoglobin, it's a very big oxygen store, so it tolerates better the temporary oxygen lack. This is what is very important in the everyday life of the function. It has many mitochondria. You can see the uh, myofibrillus are very similar to that of the skeletal muscle. However, between the myofibrillus, we have a lot of mitochondria. And this is why the striation is paler. Some book says that the paler striation of this uh, uh, cardiac muscle is due to the non-synchronized uh, myofibrillus. That's not true. You can see here and any other electromicroscopic picture that at the level of the Z membrane it's very nicely synchronized. This is why we have acceleration. However, there are big areas which is not striated, the mitochondria, and this is why it washes away, it makes paler the striation. And the mitochondria is so, it is so rich with mitochondria that if, uh, for instance, the scientists want to prepare mitochondria for scientific purpose, usually they do it from cardiac muscle. <clears throat> the Eber discs, as I mentioned, they are borderline between the cells. They are wavy, finger-like processes. This is why the surface is increased and this much more stronger attachment between the neighborhood uh, cardiac muscle cells who pull each other, and very important not to get uh, uh, broken away. Here you can see uh, the, this uh, segment of the electromicroscopic uh, picture, real, real electromicroscopic picture, and this uh, connection between the cells are uh, increased with macula and fascia anterior types binding structure. Uh, we have a lot of gap junction. The largest number of the gap junctions in our body is in the cardiac muscle. You studied the gap junction with the surface epithel before, just to remind you. Uh, these are little tunnels which bridging over the intercellular substance and let these neighborhood cells communicate uh, with each other. Uh, the, uh, the lumen is very tiny, just ions can pass through, but that's enough for sending message from one cell to others. And this is very important for the cardiac muscle because the cardiac muscle cells are not innervated. They are not controlled by nerve cells. They are not controlled by rhythmically pulsing uh, bioactive materials. The only way which tells a cardiac muscle cells when to contract is calcium signals to the gap junction. So the gap junctions are the uh, means by means, the, the, by means of which these cells can communicate with each other. They forwarding the message when to contract because it's much slower than the neural control. This is why we have a measurable difference between the time point when the top of the heart contracts and the bottom of the heart. And this difference can be very, uh, very well seen in the electrocardiography. Uh, the uh, uh, sarcoplasm uh, of the uh, cardiac muscles, similar to the skeletal muscle, we have myoglobins, which basically contains uh, uh, the, of the oxygen reserve. We have lipids and glycogen particles. This is a fuel. These are burned to get energy. And additionally, we have a hormone named ANF, which is primarily present in the atria. This is why it's named atrial natriuretic factor. And this is a hormone which controls the blood uh, quantity. Uh, whenever the pressure in the atrium become lower than is required, this uh, hormone is liberated, it acts on the kidney, and the consequence of that, the kidney keeps back sodium and water, increasing the blood volume, and more blood goes to the uh, atrium, increasing the blood pressure this way. The nuclei are located in the middle, and on the two sides of the nuclei, the myofibrils go away. In the consequence, in the line of the nuclei, there is an empty space, which is used for nothing. And practically, this is a kind of garbage can 
for the muscles. Anything, not necessarily things accumulated in the cardiac muscle cell, this will be accumulated in this area in the line of the nuclei. Uh, Usually we have a kind of brownish substances, granulated brownish substances here, what we name lipofuscin. The name comes from the two words. Fuscin comes from the Latin fuscus, which means smoky. This looks like a, a smoke of a wet uh, uh, wood. And lipo refers to something to do with the lipids. Really, most of the uh, components come from the uh, met lipid metabolism. Uh, the uh, cardiac muscle, because it requires a lot of energy, burns a lot of lipids. And many of the lipid molecules are not the normal lipid molecules, but some kind of Vox type of molecules, very huge lipid molecules. And the cardiac muscle cell has no machinery to the work, process it. Consequently, it accumulates in the cells as a garbage. Uh, very probably, this lipofuscin has also some carbohydrate components because it's uh, positive in the past stained area. It seems that the quantity of the lipofuscin will not hurt the cardiac muscle cells. We have not detectable effect on the cells. It's just a kind of accumulation of garbage. Uh, we do have a tubular system, but it's much more uh, simple. We have a single uh, system, and this is also not really rich, not really continuous. Uh, the reason for that is that, as I mentioned, the uh, cardiac muscle cells is not innervated. It doesn't have action potential, whatever is necessary for what the sarcotubular system is made. So this is why it's not really uh, uh, useful. A uh, sarcoplasmatic reticulum present there is a little bit less rich uh, uh, compared to the skeletal muscle, but it's still present and useful. We have a couple of special cardiac muscle cells, which are much longer uh, than the uh, other cardiac muscle cells, and we have very few myofibrils. Most of them, it looks like a, a sarcoplasmatic reticulum. And this is that, this is a calcium containers, and the task of these elongated uh, cells to make a faster signal conduction. Uh, the, as you studied in the middle school, uh, the uh, uh, sinoatrial node is the uh, pacemaker, the conductor of the contraction. Here is the messages uh, given where to contract the muscle, and especially to this quick conducting system, which is shown in this uh, model briefly, uh, have this type of modified fast conducting uh, cardiac muscle cells. Further details you will study in the next semester when in anatomy will study the structure of the heart. That's about the cardiac muscle. Let's switch to the smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is much smaller than the other one and narrow spindle-like uh, structures. Here you can see an interesting uh, slide. This is the upper part of the esophagus where we have mixed skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. And you can see that the skeletal muscle, single skeletal muscle fibers, is about as thick as a couple of dozen sm uh, smooth muscle. And every single dot here is a cross section of the smooth muscle cell. Uh, is, uh, in relatively few points we have nucleus inside because if we have this elongated structure and making slices of it, just from side slice you get the nucleus. Many of them has no nucleus in, uh, itself. So you can see here the cross and the the cross and the longitudinal section of the smooth muscle. If you study it for larger magnification, you can see that the nucleus is very active. It's very loose chromatin. Any kind of cells which has a certain activity uh, uh, is characterized by the loose chromatin, as you know from previous studies. It's very important to distinguish the, uh, smooth muscle from the connective tissue. Basically, both of them elongated red stuff, and we have nuclei in this area, elongated nuclei. Uh, but uh, uh, very important in identification, especially vessels, but also any other tissue. Uh, the uh, book says some uh, true but not really useful uh, information. They say that the connective tissue cells, the fibrocytes, 
has a very long needle-like nucleus with sharp edge, uh, unlike the uh, uh, smooth muscle, which has a little bit quadrangular cut-off edge and thicker. Well, uh, this is true, but in most of the slides we have oblique section of the nuclei, and this piece of information is not really uh, useful, it cannot be used. I suggest two things to distinguish them. If you have large magnification, you can easily distinguish the very active nucleus of the smooth muscle cells and the inactive dark narrow nuclei of the fibrocytes. So this is connective tissue and this is muscle even although both of them has elongated uh, red structure. In a low magnification the difference is even more visible. Uh, the staining of the smooth muscle and the uh, connective tissue differs. The smooth muscle is very intense red and a little bluish red. Because of the activity, it has a relatively a lot of ribosomes and this is not enough to make completely blue the cytoplasm, but we still have a bluish hint. Unlike the connective tissue fibers, which are paler and a little bit orange red color. So if you can see this difference between the colors, this is smooth muscle and this is connective tissue. This is especially useful for differentiation of different type of vessels. The arteries has both muscle in the media and uh, uh, this is the, the dark red, slightly bluish hint. And uh, the, uh, you can distinguish from connective tissue. The veins has connective tissue in the media, so actually almost homogeneous going into the environment. In this picture, which is similar to the previous ones I showed, uh, I can uh, show you the electromicroscopic structure of the smooth muscle. The smooth muscle has spindle shape. Also, you can see the realistic electromicroscopic picture, about 3 to 8 micrometer in diameter and 15 to 200 micrometer long. It has no striation, even although the same myofilaments uh, are there the actin and the myosin, like this uh, pale blue and the dark and the green and thick green lines, but they're not parallel to each other, which m would make a visible cross striation, but they make a network. So this cross striation is not visible in light microscope, because not even under electron microscope. Uh, these uh, 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 filaments sometimes have so-called dense bodies. These dense bodies behave like Z-membranes in the skeletal muscle. The end of these uh, uh, myofilaments uh, is con are connected into the membrane of the cell with adhering junctions. It's an actin in type. Inside, this uh, dark brown line represent, we have cytoskeleton, these are intermediate uh, type, 10 nanometer in diameter, and this desmin type of proteins. There is no sulcotubular system. Uh, the, uh, uh, even although the smooth muscle is controlled by electric signals, by innervation, but the, these are so small that the diffusion is quick enough to uh, carry the signal all over the cells very fast, so it makes no sense to have sarcoplasmatic reticulum. We do have sarcotubular system, but it's very sparse. Uh, the uh, the uh, smooth muscle has no tendon. It's either uh, they uh, make rings, so they catch its own tail, or uh, insert, in, glued into the soft tissues with glucosaminoglycans. Uh, every single uh, skeleton, uh, smooth muscle cell surrounded by a basement membrane. You can see these pus uh, state slides, both in cron section, these pus positive rings, or in longitudinal section, you can very nicely see that. Uh, around the uh, smooth muscle cells, we have rich uh, collagen uh, fibers, and Neither the collagen fibers nor the proteoglycans are produced by fibrocytes, but the smooth muscle cells themselves. As I mentioned, collagen fibers can be produced by several other cells, not only by the fibroblast fibrocyte family. Among them, we have the smooth muscle, which can build its own uh, collagen fibers. Uh, there is a very interesting contraction mechanism, so the myofilaments are not uh, 
parallel each other, but make a kind of network. Obliquely opposite points of the membranes are connected. And this is, uh, uh, whenever they contract, they look like a ham. Uh, this is, makes this kind of very strange uh, shape. One of the advantage of this type of contraction mechanism is it can contract by much shorter than the skeletal muscle. Uh, this was about the general description of the smooth muscle. In the rest of the lecture, I like to uh, repeat the contraction mechanism of the muscles, especially the uh, skeletal muscles. I know you studied in biophysics in details, but let me briefly summarize, just remind you the details. Uh, as, you, as you see, the uh, uh, most important feature of the muscular contraction is that the two basic elements, the thick filaments, uh, sometimes named myosin, and the thin filaments do not change their size uh, during the contraction, but sliding beside each other. How it happens? Let's see some details. The th uh, thick filaments, what uh, is named uh, in the middle school uh, myosin, consists of large number of real myosin molecules. It's about, it consists of 274 myosin molecules. The myosin, each myosin molecules has, it consists of a, a heavy chain and two line chains. The heavy chain has tail. Uh, this is about uh, 150 nanometer long and quite relatively big, 220 kilodalton protein. Usually two myosin molecules woven together, so here we can do myosin molecules. The head is also wavy, and to the head, two small protein molecules named light chains are connected. These are really small uh, protein molecules, about 20 kilodalton in molecular weight. And these play roles in the contraction mechanism by sticking to the other filaments, the thin filament. The thin, thin filaments is generally called actin, the uh, backbone of it is really an active molecular, similar to the active molecule generally located in every cell, and it's uh, made of round G-actin uh, units. These actin units have a double chain, which has a spiral close to 90 nanometer in periodicity, and uh, this is very similar to the actin uh, microfilament. However, here we have a huge, narrow, double-chained protein molecular named tropomyosin, which prevents the stepping out or stepping in G actin, so it cannot get shortened or longer. It is a fixed size. Additionally, we have other helping molecules like troponin, I, T, and C, various subtypes, which play a role in the contraction mechanism. Beside these two major primary protein system, the thick and the thin filament, we have a couple of other uh, proteins which build up the sarcomere. They summarize as scaffold proteins. Uh, maybe the most important from them, the so-called Z-disc Z or Z-membrane, which ends the sarcomere, makes a kind of borderline, and also a kind of control unit of the sar uh, sarcomere. The the, this is the end of one myofilament, and this is the beginning of another one. And you can see the Z-membranes are connected by desmin, or skeleton type of proteins. Uh, the 2D Z-disc, the uh, thin filament, is fixed by alpha actinin molecules. This is also the component of the scaffold protein. And similarly, M proteins are fixing the middle components of the thick filaments. Additionally, we can see two very huge molecules. These are the uh, largest known protein molecules in our body, the nebulin and the titin. These are single spiral-shaped protein molecules, the task of which is to keep the free ends of the thin and the thick filaments in the middle. So whenever they contract, move together, the spiral becomes uh, much more uh, higher wind, and uh, but still keep the end in place, and whenever they relax, the spring gets uh, flattened and still keep its place. Similar way, the chitin working, so chitin is the line of the thick and nebulin is the thin filament, however, it's identical, structure, uh, identical function. And finally, I'd like to show a little summary of how the muscle contracts. 
Whenever the muscle is in a low energy way, low energy state, for instance, no, not enough ATP, for instance, after death, this is the death stiffness, the thick filament and the thin filament connected to each other. In the following models, you can see a little segment with a single uh, myosin molecular of the thick filament and a little segment of thin filament with also one unit. So here, the uh, head of the myosin molecule is attached to the actin, the thin filament. Consequently, they are fixed together. You cannot move the muscle, so this is really stiff. Luckily enough, this uh, situation happens just a fraction of a second if we work normally after the contract, at the end of the termination of the contraction. Uh, normally, we have a good energy. ATP is uh, bound to the head of the uh, myosin molecular and has two consequences. Number one, the uh, head of the myosin will release the binding site, so the two filaments will not be connected anymore. And also very important, the neck of the uh, myosin is getting straightened, and this plays a very important role in the contraction mechanism. At the same time, the troponin molecules will change their conformation, cover the area where the head is binding, consequently, it cannot be bound there anymore until the troponin molecules are there. And this is the, the loose muscle. This is where we usually we have the muscles uh, uh, normally because it's a good energizing, energized way. Now let's see how it contracts. Uh, this is uh, supposed to be the membrane of the skeletal muscle with the sarcotubular system. And the nerve ending, which is responsible for control, is attached to that, making a true synapse. When action potential is running through the axon, and reaching the terminals uh, from the sec uh, secondary vesicles, acetylcholine transmitter is liberated and gets into the space between the terminals and the surface of the uh, muscle. In the surface of the muscle, in the membrane muscle, we have acetylcholine receptors built in, and whenever they are exposed to acetylcholine, they open up ion channels. Potassium goes out, sodium goes in, so the membrane potential changing, and this change runs all over the membrane, like very similar to that of the nerve uh, cells as axion potential. In the membrane of the muscle, we have a voltage-gated calcium channels built in. Whenever the axion potential reaches them, they open up and let calcium to go from the environment into the muscle. Uh, the calcium primarily acts on special receptors on the sarcoplasmatic reticulum named riodinin receptors, and this, whenever exposed to calcium, open up the channels, calcium channels of the sarcoplasmatic reticulum. As you know, this is a big calcium store, and whenever the receptors are activated, this calcium, which is stored inside, most of them are liberated. The primary is a self-stimulation system, primary ensures a large calcium concentration. Whenever the uh, calcium reaches the uh, uh, troponin molecules, they will leave the original place, they change the conformation, and it let the head of the myosin attached to the binding site again. After the attachment, the head of the myosin becomes a low energy state, it releases phosphor, and uh, the consequence of that is that it, the neck changes its shape, it changes the conformation, it moves about 5 to 10 nanometer, and because the head is already glued to, fixed to the thin filament, it pulls the thin filament by that way. Of course, if you do similar movements after each other very rapidly with different heads, we have a couple of hundred heads there, we have a visible movement, visible sliding of the active molecular inside. Finally, uh, we have this low energy stage, so the head of the myosin is attached to the actin, the neck is bent, and it's waiting for energizing. After the contraction, if we are gone condition, there will be a good, quick energetization, and the whole thing starts again. Uh, with this animation, I want to show this one in model. 
activation of the myosin, energy releasing and changing the neck conformation, troponins uh, occupy the place. Action potential coming, acetylcholine liberates, uh, the, uh, the receptors open, uh, uh, initiate the action potential, calcium channels open, calcium amplification acts on the troponin, releases the place, and uh, the whole thing, the energizing happens again. I can show you a little bit quicker that one. Uh, as you know, all of my uh, lecture, no uh, lecture notes or lecture documents are on the internet, including this one. You can download it and see it. it's a very simple animated GIF. Finally, I'd like to show you a couple of electron microscopic pictures. You can see myofibrillus in a relatively low power electron microscopic picture, very nicely synchronized to each other. So this is one, this is the second one, and so on. And the A and the I filaments are synchronized to each other. We have very few mitochondria. This is the difference between the skeletal and the cardiac muscle, and this tells this is a skeletal muscle. With a higher magnification, if it's two bordering uh, myofibrils, you can see they are pretty much synchronized by the Z-membrane, and these particles are glycogen particles, which is used as a fuel of active, uh, moving the muscle. Here in the middle, uh, size uh, microscopic picture, you can see very nicely these uh, glycogen particles. And in a cross section, you can see that this is the thick filaments, it's the high power electron microscopy. That in every direction, we have heads of the uh, thick filament myosin molecules, and they are attached to actin filaments. In this picture, you can see cardiac muscle. Uh, the only difference, but it's very fundamental difference, is that we have a lot of mitochondria between the filaments, the structural filaments, and the synchronization of these filaments by the Z-membranes are identical. Just the large number of, uh, of uh, mitochondria tells that. Here you can see a contracted and it's a relatively relaxed thing. And now here you can see the Ebner stripes, the connection. This is one cell, this is another cell, and you can see the border lines between them is an Ebner slice. And this is what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you very much for your attention.